Okay, hello and uh, welcome everyone to uh, today's presentation uh, from Chromalox. We're going to uh, cover some some opportunities in the chemical production world. We're going to talk about some of the advantages that Chromalox provides uh, through decarbonization and electrification of things. Uh, some some uh, small impact and examples that you may want to consider uh, in your facility and some of the projects you're working on. And today uh, we've got uh, Dean Strauser, he's our, our business development manager for Engineered Chemicals, and Mike Kennedy, who's the uh, market sector sales manager, to uh, walk us through these uh, opportunities and products and uh, applications and kind of give you some insight into some of the things that Chromalox provides. So, um, then before I hand it off to them, uh, note to everyone on the call, please submit any of your questions in the, uh, the chat uh, portion of the presentation, and we will be sure to address those at the end. So uh, without, with that uh, out of the way, we'll get started. Uh, Dean, Mike, you all set? Yes, yes. Okay, Hello. take it over. Hello, everybody. Uh, as Derek said, Business Development Manager for Engineered Chemicals. I've been in the industrial electric heater business uh, for 32 years, and I'm based out of Houston, Texas. And thank you for, for joining uh, Mike and I today. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks, Dean. Um, my name is Mike Kennedy. I'm the market sales sector sales manager for the Engineer Chemical. Uh, I've been in the electric heating business for approximately 15 years now. I'm based out of uh, Montreal, Canada. All right. Um, before we get started, uh, let's begin with a brief history of Chromalox. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, Chromalox was the first company to patent an electric resistance wire uh, surrounded by an inner core with an outer metal seat. Um, we call that the uh, commonly known as the strip heater. Uh, as pictured here, metal strip heaters were used to heat rail cars in, in, the, uh, in the old days. Um, and since then, we've graduated into making tubular heating elements, and you'll see the uh, patent to the uh, in the middle of the screen. And I'll, um, and those were uh, tubular elements were used for electric stove applications. Um, we've been in business since uh, again uh, 1917. We were acquired by Spark Starco in 2017. Spark Starco is known in the industry as uh, steam specialty steam control. Uh, uh, very global uh, brand there. And um, what we'd like to do is uh, we'd like to have the customers leverage our 104 years of experience to assist you with your electrification and decarbonation efforts. Um, as mentioned, uh, it all started with the uh, strip heaters. Uh, since then, um, we, uh, we manufacture complete thermal, thermal management solutions for all types of applications. Uh, with global third-party uh, certifications. So depending on where you are in the world, uh, most likely we'll have a, a, cert a certification that, uh, that will meet, uh, meet your needs. So we have uh, our component technologies, uh, which is cartridge, tubular heaters, band strips, temperature controls, also our power controls. Uh, a lot of these uh, uh, products are used uh, at the OEM level. Um, and at the end user level at industrial facilities. Um, we have our industrial heaters and systems, which consist of uh, tubular elements welded into uh, uh, flanges, and, uh, and uh, those can be ASME code, or and we can put these flange heaters inside circulation heaters. Uh, we do uh, tank heating, uh, heat transfer systems. We do packaged engineered kit systems. And uh, a big thing that we do uh, uh, out of one of our sites is we do uh, build uh, the control panel, power control panels for all of our heaters. Um, we have duct heaters, we have comfort heaters, we also do uh, steam generation. Another big product that we offer um, is our heat tray systems. Um, and we manufacture um, uh, heat tracing for various industries uh, from self-regulating cable, uh, to MI cable for higher temperatures. And we also do the complete uh, controls uh, uh, for these uh, products as well. Um, hey, Mike, with your 15 plus years of experience uh, with Chromalux, what stands out to you? Well, what I can tell you is what I've seen with my time at Chromalux, as you guys can well see there with the breadth of products uh, that we have, 
but also the experience throughout Chromalox. Uh, we also work as a team and stuff like that. I have rarely come across an application that a customer has come to us uh, with an issue or whatever that we have not been able to uh, offer a solution for. All right, very good. Um, here's our manufacturing uh, footprint throughout the globe. Um, we have our IHS facility, which is the uh, systems and flange heaters, um, process type equipment uh, in Ogden, Utah. Um, we have our headquarters in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, that's where we have our application engineering and uh, our corporate offices. Uh, we also have a facility here uh, in North America with uh, Nueva Laredo in Mexico. We do some IHS equipment and some component technologies. Um, and then we also have that facility in Laverne, Tennessee, uh, that we do heat trace, uh, we do stock components there, and that's where we build our control panels as well. We have a facility over in, uh, in France for IHS, and uh, which for manufacturing, engineering, we do some distribution out of there. And then uh, lastly, we have our facility in uh, uh, China, uh, where we uh, manufacture uh, heat trace products uh, for the APAC region. Um, you can see that uh, by some of the uh, blue colored squares, uh, these are uh, some uh, also other sales offices uh, as well. All right, so uh, let's talk about electric resisting uh, heating and control now. So um, one of the, uh, you know, this is the basic technology um, behind our product. So it's important to, to know what that technology is. So we start with an uh, electric resistive uh, nichrome wire, which was, you know, used in our original patent. And we uh, take the uh, nichrome wire and we put it inside a, a tubing. And this tubing could be any type of metallurgy. It can be uh, anywhere from <clears throat> from copper to ink and L625 or uh, ink 800. Ink 800 is very common, especially for industrial applications. Uh, once we drop that nichrome wire in there, we use an insulator, which we call magnesium oxide. We use magnesium oxide because it's uh, an excellent uh, thermal conductive material, plus it also has excellent dielectric uh, strength, which uh, you know the last thing you want is that nichrome wire uh, because it's being powered uh, with voltage. Uh, you don't want that to ground a sheath. So having that uh, that nichrome wire centered inside that coil is imperative. And we have, of course, all the quality checks to make sure that's the case. We don't want any voids in there. Um, and then we also have the, the cold pin and the termination. And that's where the uh, voltage is supplied to the heaters. Um, another type of technology that uh, we invented is the medium voltage electric heating. It's also called direct connect. We use the same core concepts as low voltage, but but uh, we can go up to voltages as high as 7,200 uh, uh, volts without the use of a transformer. And so that's the reason why we call it direct connect, because you're directly connecting to the power supply at the facility, uh, the higher higher voltage power supply. All right, so, you know, how does medium voltage compare to low voltage? Um, Using direct connect can reduce the amperages up to 17 times, depending on the voltage supply being used. As you see in the, uh, as pictured here using Ohm's law, um, the 17 times comes by, uh, comes through, uh, of course, using Ohm's law calculation to um, calculate amperage. But at, in this example, at 380 volt incoming supply, um, typically you'd see uh, uh, at three phase, you'd see 4,900 amps. Uh, and 63 circuits. Uh, that's a lot of amps to handle and to provide power to a, uh, to a single heater. Um, that's a lot of circuits uh, and wiring to have to run from the control panel out to the heater. So with our direct connect technology, as a comparison, um, using 6600 volt, we're able to reduce the amperage to 280 amps um, and only use three circuits. So your wiring installation costs really are significantly significantly reduced and plus from a maintenance standpoint it's a lot easier to maintain a heater with three circuits as it is with a heater with 63 circuits
All right. So uh, based on the topic of decarbonization, um, we want to talk about well, what is zero emission heat energy? Um, and zero emit, uh, emission heat energy is basically, uh, in a nutshell, is decarbonization. So um, Chromalox is impacting the industry in small and big ways in order to assist customers with electrification and decarbonization. Um, in order to do that, we have to understand, well, what type of emissions are we looking to reduce? So uh, the main two is scope one emissions and scope two emissions. So the scope one emissions are, these are source emissions uh, located at the plant facility. So if you're, if you have a facility, let's say in the ship channel in Houston or up in Canada or anywhere globally, this is going to be direct emissions from, from the plant, from uh, fossil fuel fired equipment. Uh, the other type of emissions is scope two emissions, and these are indirect emissions from the generation of third party uh, or purchase uh, combined heat and power from another source. So um, these are directly piped or um, or wired through via transmission lines from uh, from power sources. So if if you have a the the perfect scenario is if 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 you want to reduce scope one and scope two emissions is um, you can use uh, electrify uh, at the facility from fossil fuel fired equipment. And then also, if your power sources are from renewable power, um, that is a win-win situation. So um, the reason why uh, <clears throat> you know we're focused on this is because chemical companies, you know, they're under pressure um, from investors, governments, and the public um, for their ESG strategies. Um, so there's a lot of companies right now that uh, they're getting uh, they're getting you know directives. Either from uh, the local, you know, government, state, regional governments uh, to decarbonize, or they're being asked by headquarters um, to decarbonize uh, locally. So the question is, you know, what do you do now? And and that's where we can we can help with electrification. You know, these are some of the benefits of. Uh, of direct connect medium voltage versus fossil fuel fired process heating. Um, uh, you know, when evaluating the cost of large systems, you know, it's important to consider the, the total ownership cost, uh, not just the capital equipment cost. Um, that will be discussed later at, at a, you know, in depth at a later time. Um, we're happy to help you with that. Um, as far as the uh, differences is the you know 90 99% efficient. Uh, there's no flue stack losses out of the top. Um, precise temperature control with thyristors via proportional control. Um, you could almost get 100% turndown with electric heat, whereas with fossil fuel fired, it's very difficult to do that. And as you do try to um, uh, proportion the uh, or, or try to reduce the um, the output of the gas fired, it actually becomes less efficient. And the two big things, I guess, it would be the zero on-site emissions. Uh, no need for emission control systems. A lot of these uh, uh, gas fired equipment required selective catalytic reduction uh, systems. Um, those are costly capital expenditures as well. And then, uh, most importantly, no environmental uh, permitting required uh, with electric heat. Again, um, we want to make sure that, you know, when you're looking at uh, a true analysis between electric and gas that you really need to take a look at, you know, your thermal conversion efficiencies, uh, your operational efficiencies, and all the losses that go, that go with um, fossil fuel fired equipment. Um, Mike, do you have anything uh, to, to add regarding this? Yeah, sure. I I really just want to reiterate. I mean, Dean, you you mentioned it a few times there, but uh, the total ownership cost again is, uh, and not just the capital equipment. It is extremely important when comparing those two technologies, fuel fire to electrification. Um, you know, we also need to keep in mind the emission costs that are going to come at future dates and are on now. I mean, these these companies are going to be uh, taxed. Um, 
with air permits and carbon tax and so on and so forth. So it's the real total ownership. Uh, and we at Chromalox can help you out with that, with evaluating everything. We've come up with them. Um, we have calculators and stuff. We can sit down with the with the proper folks uh, at these facilities and kind of run through the whole scenario and not just look at um, you know the the cost of the equipment sort of thing. Run things over a five, ten year, twenty year span of operation costs and taxes and so on and so forth. Yeah, and this this is a, a perfect example of my what Mike was saying. I mean, um, if you take a look at a, a gas fired uh, a boiler, um, it emits 465 tons of CO2 per 1 million BTU per year. And in this case, uh, the cost of the um, the carbon taxes was $25 per ton of CO2. So that's 11,625. Uh, per 1 million B2 a year. So, you know, 1 million BTU, that's only like 333 KW around there. So, um, you know, that's not necessarily for, for Direct Connect. That's, that's you know, that's really not a candidate for Direct Connect, but it's it's a candidate for our low voltage heater at 1 million BTUs. But just imagine with when you're dealing with 10 megawatts. I mean, that's that's a lot of savings that you're going, you're going to be, uh, uh, or, you know, using for electric heaters versus versus the uh, fossil fuel fire. So uh, even the uh, another you know factor to take a look at is what are your annual facility air permits costing you? If you're a Title Five Title Five company, um, that those are considered major uh, emission sources, uh, plant sources of of emissions. Um, it can be up to three hundred thousand dollars every single year. So if you have the uh, piece of equipment, uh, a fossil fuel fired, let's say a boiler or, or a, a furnace, and you're looking to electrify, well, then you can also take the the 300,000 uh, over the equipment life, you know, 25 to 30 years. That's that's a huge cost savings. All right, so we'll start talking about some applications here. Um, and again, if uh, you have some questions, uh, feel free to uh, put them in the chat and we'll be happy to, to discuss these. So um, we want to, we just want to reiterate that customers are already using Chromalox products successfully to decarbonize. Uh, we work with customers on an everyday basis to require reliability and robust designs for demanding applications, such as the examples you see here. These solutions for the for the uh, for these applications are available in both low voltage and medium voltage. Yeah, great point, uh, Dean. I mean, these are these are some of the stuff, the applications that we see and we get involved in on a on a daily basis. Um, in my experience, most of the common ones are, say, water glycol heaters, uh, steam and steam superheaters. Uh, we can do that with uh, with electric electric heaters, uh, regen heaters. Heat transfer systems uh, are just some of the examples, um, but I mean, every day we're dealing with these. Uh, we have more and more and more. All right, so, uh, you know, there are multiple decarb opportunities at, at, uh, at chemical sites. Um, you know, chromalox electric heaters are used for processes that were previously considered only for fossil fuel fired equipment. Um, again, you know, if you're processing naphthas, paraffins, or olefins, uh, you know, and you're using a fired heater, we, there's, there's applications for electric heaters. Um, you know, most of these process, processes re require distillation. They require uh, dry gas feedstocks. Um, the dry gas has, uh, comes from uh, absorber dryers and absorber dryers. I mean, these use catalyst beds. These catalyst beds need to be regenerated, um, and they can be regenerated with the uh, electric process heaters. Absolutely, Dean. I and mean, these uh, every day we're we're working with uh, with folks out there. These electric heaters are being used for preheating uh, and or uh, supplement heating on a fuel fired system. They they run them t in tandem uh, to to add extra heat. Uh, they can also be used when you need to retrofit or upgrading fuel fire heaters. Um, you know, you can reach out to any any one of us here at Chromalox, Dean, myself. We can help you guys uh, uh, in these retrofit as we're going to see them in the in the coming years.
You know, one of the one of the basic chemicals uh, that that's manufactured is, is ethylene glycol, and um, ethylene glycol is used to make monoethylene glycol, triethylene glycol. All these products for uh, ethylene glycol, um, you know, they're used in basic feedstocks for other chemical processes. Um, you know, these uh, processes, re these feedstocks need to be heated and purified. Um, you know, they need to be stored. Um, you know, almost every single distillation condom utilizes a reboiler. It could, it, it's, it's indirect heating of the distillation column, but they're using steam or heat transfer fluid. That steam or heat transfer fluid needs to be heated. It, it, it may be, you know, some of the sources of these, uh, of the heat, heat source comes from uh, fossil fuel fired equipment. So that could be a candidate uh, if you are using other sources. Now th this picture here is, uh, you can see the gas fired heater on the far right. Uh, you know, it's sitting outside of the has cla hazardous class area. And then you can see uh, circled on the left side is the uh, reboiler itself. So this is a perfect application for a direct connect medium voltage heater to replace an existing uh, fuel fired heater. Another big application, as, as, as was mentioned before, and I know Mike touched on, was the regeneration heaters for, for the gas purification. In this particular slide, we, uh, we have a, a gas phase reactor that's used to make polyethylene and polypropylene. Um, in this case, um, it, it's important for that gas phase reactor to have dry purified incoming gas into it, uh, into the fluidized bed reactor. Um, this is a uh, heater that Chromalux supplied for a polyethylene process. I mean, each polymer technology will have its own polymer recipe. However, the need for dried and purified incoming gas requirement, it really doesn't change through the applications. The more purified the incoming gas stream, the better the quality of the customer uh, produced product. Um, fossil fuel fired regeneration heaters are being replaced with electric direct connect heaters. Here's the case of a regeneration. Um, you know, here's an example where it's using a fuel fired, uh, they're using a fuel fired regen gas heater on the left, uh, the bottom left versus a zero emission electric uh, regen gas heater on the right. Um, and it's, you know, it's circled there in red. As you can see, one side of the dryer is purging and while the other side of the unit is drying and purifying the gas feedstock. We can handle up to pressures up, uh, uh, you know, this is low to medium pressure, and we can handle temps up to uh, 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. Next slide, please. Yep. Um, the other type of uh, electric heaters that can be used is for solvent reboiler heaters. So in this particular application, um, certain bolt plastics, synthetic rubbers, uh, polyesters, uh, polyesters, polyethylenes, th um, this is another type of what we call solution polymerization. The previous slide was a gaseous polymerization. So um, even though the polymer recipe is different, uh, dry and purified catalysts and gas fee stacks are needed. Um, the solvent needs to be reco recovered uh, by using reboilers. Um, electric heater heaters a definite should be a definite consideration for these processes, either heating directly or indirectly. Yeah, Dean, I just wanted to add something. Well, I'm not sure if I'm on the right uh, slide or not, uh, Derek. Uh, I might have been having an issue on my side, so I might need some help from you guys. But uh, if you're on the chemical uh, production solvent recovery boiler slide. Um, that middle diagram is showing our our trademark uh, direct connect medium voltage steam generator, um, and those guys are available up to. Thank you, Derek. Um, just came through. Um, those uh, those steam generators are available up to voltage of uh, 7200 kV. We can.
can move on. Thank you. Okay, again, um, using specialty chemicals or polymer resins, uh, also known as polyamides, um, you know, many of these special feedstocks are made from basic chemicals and gases. Uh, many of the feed, feedstock gases and liquids are, are, you know, they're made at site. So there's many specialty chemical companies that uh, they're getting the basic chemical feedstock from another facility down, you know, maybe, you know, most of these plants are located next to each other. So they're getting the, the basic feedstocks and they're actually um, uh, reforming the chemicals, if you were making their own recipes. So, um, you know, when they're making these polymer resins, I mean, these are endothermic reactions um, that require heaters. Uh, endothermic reactions are are more favorable, you know, to electric heating. Um, you know, great a great candidate. Um, you know, in this particular case, that this is a for a nylon process. I mean, it it requires the the uh, the reactors to be heated. Um, you know, customers can decentralize from larger fossil fuel fired heaters to a point of use electric uh, heat transfer system. You know, there might be a, you know, they may be using a very, very large uh, uh, gas fired heater for this application, but, you know, these reactors can be heated. Um, you know, we could provide a heater that sits right next to the reactor. Um, pictured in the middle here is uh, our chromalox medium uh, oil system, which is called our, our, uh, our MOS. Yeah, great, great photo there, Dean. Um, these MOS system, it's a mid-size oil heat transfer system, uh, and we call them ready to ready to go. They're plug and play kind of design, so they're pre-engineered. Um, uh, so I mean, they come skid mounted, control panel that's mounted there. You got your pump um, and your heater. That's that's all involved there. So uh, they're designed pre-engineered uh, for quicker turnaround and quicker delivery for for customers. Okay, so most of these, uh, again, most of these polymerization processes use catalysts, reactors, and solvents. Um, you know, examples are polyethylene rubbers, PET, PE, <clears throat> cross-link polyethylene. I mean, so whether it be for a vaporizer application or indirectly heating with a hot oil heater, these processes can be converted from fossil fuel fire to electric. Uh, pictured here, we have a vaporizer on the left-hand side, We've got a, a, a thermal transfer fluid heater pictured in the center. All right, and you know, the, the previous examples, we, we did show you some larger systems for, for direct connect applications and, and for higher KW uh, uh, low voltage applications, but um, you know, well, let's talk about some small impacts at the facility. I mean, all chemicals need to have thermal management when being transferred and uh, transported and stored. Uh, these are great applications to decarbonize and make small impacts. So, for example, at times decentralizing from larger fossil fuel fire heaters to point of use uh, tank heating and our pipe heating will be more efficient. Yeah, great point, Dean. Again, uh, on the previous slide, that was our um, photos from our, our tank heating brochure at Chromalox. Um, what I really like is it shows the different shapes and sizes, locations of, of storage tanks uh, that we've seen out there. And Chromalox can help in any different way. We come many, many, many ways to uh, to heat these tanks. Um, also, I mean, you, you have process lines to and from these tanks and to the processes. So uh, heat trace is a very, very hel uh, um, helpful way or a needy way to uh, to help also do these small impacts, as Dean was mentioning. Yeah, so, um, you know, as this slide was, was shown, I mean, whether you're heating tanks directly or indirectly, I mean, we do have a solution. And as Mike was mentioning, Chromalox has so many different solutions for tank heating, whether you will need to decentralize from or supplement ex existing inefficient fuel fire heaters uh, with electric point of use heaters. Um, you know, keep in mind that uh, a lot of the terminal heaters for for uh, that use gas fired were designed for function, not necessarily efficiency. So again, excellent candidates.
you know, again, this is some small impacts here that we're showing with some tank heaters. We have some of those MOS systems, the uh, medium oil systems that uh, are directly next to the tank. Uh, we're heating a heat transfer fluid uh, through the heater, uh, and, you know, and the heat transfer fluid flows through the coils and uh, provides uh, heating and temperature maintenance uh, for the application. Decentralizing heating from larger sources of fossil fuel fired heaters to electric heating can improve efficiency while making small decarbon impacts that could add up to significant impacts if you're talking about, uh, you know, from a facility wide basis or maybe you're making, maybe your company owns several different sites. So if you have several different sites, uh, and you're making small impacts at one facility, they, they will add up. Um, for the entirety of your company. Very true, Dean. Um, again, we talk about small impacts and, and simple designs. Um, I mean, we're showing here some uh, indirect, what we're going to call in direct uh, immersion heaters. And what I like about the, the top right um, photo uh, shows a, a, an extremely simple design uh, with your immersion heater, direct immersion heater. You've got a process sensor, you've got level sensors and your control panel uh, that are located uh, within you know direct proximity of the tank, so it's great for controllability. Any type of maintenance that need to be done, uh, we can have communication back to any type of master control center. That's not a problem. Um, and our products can be installed in the general purpose areas or has rated areas. Uh, that's not an issue. Anything can be designed for all all those classification areas. So I mentioned earlier about electric heat trace. Uh, I, I also say it's a, it's a very, very important application uh, for these chemical facilities. Uh, this Chromalox DTS is what we call it. It's a digital thermostat. Uh, it's a single, single circuit uh, point of use controller that has been a great hit uh, in de decentralizing heat trace from a master control center. Uh, can be installed in all areas as well um, and also can be used with existing installation. Um, electric heat trace is an alternative alternative to heat transfer systems, uh, trying to heat up pipes, uh, process uh, lines, and so on and so forth, as well as the, the steam lines. And it can be worked in conjunction with. You can have steam lines and you can have um, heat trace, depending. We just got to size that properly to make sure we get the proper heat trace on it. Um, can also help with rebates in certain regions and states and, and to optimize with electricity consumption um, as well the con you know, control single individual circuits instead of multiple lines at the same time. So in summary, there are many chemical processes and stored chemicals that require heat either directly or indirectly. We have zero heat em uh, emission heat energy uh, solutions, electric solutions available today, whether or not you're looking for replacement, decentralization, or retrofitting uh, existing uh, fossil fuel fired equipment. Uh, whether your application is large or small, uh, Chromalox can help you. And uh, that that uh, that concludes our uh, our uh, presentation. Um, you know, we would love to uh, hear from you, um, and you know, with some questions, or if you would like to contact us, you see our uh, contact information on the right part of the slide. Um, before uh, you know, before we go, we want to thank you very much for your time, and uh, we're going to hand this over to Derek uh, for some. Uh, applicable uh, Q, uh, Q and A session. Uh, thank you, Dean, and, and thank you, Mike, for your presentation uh, and your, your insight into some of the decarbonization things. Uh, I do have a couple quick questions. Uh, one, uh, does, does Chromalox provide a thermal audit of, of sorts to assist with the uh, of deciding which processes at a facility are good candidates uh, for electrification of some of our products? I mean, the you like yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, yeah, I can take care of that. No problem. Um, 
Yeah, the, the answer is yes, definitely. So um, what what we do for customers is, um, you know, if they call us and, you know, you saw that slide with, with the gentleman that, you know, had the question mark next to him at the very beginning of the, of the presentation, you know, you really didn't know what to do uh, when it comes to decarbonization. You know, he got the, uh, he got the word from HQ uh, that you're looking for decarbonization uh, applications or places they can decarb. And so when we get those calls, um, what we'll do is, um, we will have our outside sales engineers, uh, you know, with with myself or Mike, we did, you know, do it, you know, via <clears throat> via Teams or, or, or teleconference or, or maybe our OSC is close to you and they can go out to your plant. But we will ask you to, uh, you know, provide a list of the diff different processes you have in your facility that use fossil fuel fired equipment. And we will determine based on the temperatures and the pressures um and of course the application of whether or not we we can help you or not but in most cases um you know there are places to to make uh large impacts and there's of course always places to make uh small impacts so happy to help with with the uh, thermal audits okay excellent um and then uh, next question on uh, esg strategies um uh, mike you've mentioned uh, uh some of the rebates uh the de decarbonization probably some and I know some connections with the DOE projects and stuff. Where do, uh, where do you find those or where do you look for those? Just yeah, that's a great, great question. Uh, that's that's through the EPA uh, and through government and stuff like that. But you can actually just get on energy.gov. Um, I believe that's particular to the U.S. Um, Canada and other other countries and stuff might have different uh, locations that you can see that. But uh, look through that. And I, I believe they renamed it. I think it's called uh, weather, weatherization. Excuse me. Um, and we can you can look in that and they'll talk about all the rebates and programs and stuff in your in your local state and region. All right, excellent. What weather as they say, that, that's not an easy word to say. No, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, well, uh, fair enough. I, I know we've we've kind of gotten to the end of the half hour and um, uh, no more questions at the moment. Uh, you do have all of our contact information uh, information on the screen now. Uh, Mike, Dean, really appreciate your time and, and presenting today and, and uh, walking through some of these applications for everyone. So uh, if anyone does have any questions, thoughts, or comments beyond this, please reach out to us. Uh, otherwise, I think we're going to wrap it up. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you.